Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the All In Crypto podcast. I am your host, All In Crypto, and today I am delighted to introduce my next guest. We have Barney Mannering, the founder of the Vega Protocol, on the show to us today to talk about Vega Protocol and all things DeFi. So welcome on board, Barney. It is a pleasure to have you here. Thanks. It's great to be here. Yeah, and with all my guests, I find uh, in the crypto space, there's a real eclectic group of uh, people here. Uh, I always like to start with them and perhaps a little bit of your background and how you ended up uh, in the crypto space. Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm a computer scientist, I guess, by trade or, or education or whatever. Um, so very much always been into kind of, you know, the technical side of things, um, very into like the cryptography and privacy sort of worlds as well, even sort of prior to cryptocurrencies being a thing you sort of had the the cypherpunks you had you know tor you had cryptography like pgp and all of that sort of stuff and the crypto wars um you know where the u.s government tried to restrict access to cryptography and and failed uh so i'd always sort of been interested in that stuff um but i ended up uh working in sort of tradition, what you call traditional finance um building trading systems designing trading systems risk systems working with bankers traders exchanges things like that uh, spent a couple of years at the london stock exchange for instance um and you know in in that time obviously i spent got very close to kind of trading trading systems products like derivatives how they work uh, but also the markets and and that world um and i always found it fascinating very interesting clearly a huge part of the world but also um obviously this incredibly unfair thing which is very very difficult for new innovation to come into very sort of protected for a large small number of large institutions and, and very sort of regulated and, and heavily controlled. Um, and so when Bitcoin arrived, it was kind of this sort of breath of fresh air, this interesting like opening up of the potential for finance that's more like the kind of ideals of kind of the internet and, and sort of computers and kind of personal computing. Um, and then, you know, Ethereum, um, you know, I was lucky enough as having done a very small amount of Bitcoin mining, I was lucky enough to kind of notice Ethereum early on and get into the pre-sale there. And that sort of just kind of got me attached to the space in a way, but also thinking a lot about what could happen if you could do this like decentralized computation where you don't need a sort of operator of a central server, you don't need someone to be responsible. It's actually the whole network that's responsible for what happens. Um, and that got me thinking a lot about, you know, how you could properly sort of upend finance in a decentralized way, not just kind of moving Bitcoins around, but actually financial products. Um, and, and as a result of that, I ended up doing a little bit of work, you know, sort of on the side and as exploratory work in my previous job, and then eventually ended up in the startup world. And, you know, in sort of early 2018, after spending 2017, really getting deep into crypto and DeFi with with Ramsey, who I co-founded Vega with um, in 2018, and very much, um, you know, got into actually starting Vega and, and getting deeper into the space. Yeah, and I think your background um, definitely is going to provide some uh, amazing insight into what it is you're trying to do with uh, Vega Protocol. Uh, and, and and I feel like people, and you'll know this firsthand, really underestimate, and it's probably because most people aren't in that world, just how central finance is to all of our lives, and yet nobody understands it, right? Well, I wouldn't say nobody, most people. Um, so I think there's a real movement, not just from a, a technology point of view with crypto, which is this really blanket term, but also socially as well in regards to people educating themselves about finance, how it all works, um, and this whole idea of a, a, a decentralized ledger. And, and, and before I dive into Vega Protocol, as somebody uh, as interesting as yourself, uh, I would absolutely love to ask you, you know, mining Bitcoin very early, uh, a seed round investor in Ethereum. So, so, so you sort of followed this space and watched it progress. What do you think is happening here with this technology? What What are your, it's a very hard thing, I guess, to summarize because it, it, it encapsulates so much, but do you see this as a technological revolution akin to the internet? Do you think it's something more than that? Do you, what's your general idea of what's happening with the crypto space? I, mean, I think there are two things. There are two things. And actually, you know, they, it's easy to conflate them and it's easy to get confused. And a lot of the last year or two has been about like the first of those things, which is kind of, the less interesting thing, and I would kind of call it like regulatory arbitrage on online gambling. And kind of what I mean is everywhere in the world pretty much has some restriction on the ability of like retail consumers to kind of gamble online. And, you know, in the UK, it's actually pretty open. Like you can have spread betting, you can have online betting. There are like restrictions on kind of certain retail derivatives and how much leverage you can have. But in general, like people in the UK can 
can gamble pretty freely online, I think. Whereas in other countries, including the US, there's a huge restriction. It's very, very difficult to kind of get access to kind of gamble on, you know, the outcome of whether it's sports or whether it's markets or whatever. And that kind of like speculative stroke gambling side of um, you know, demand from consumers is actually what I think is driving a lot of, you know, retail trading that you see in crypto, whether it's perps, whether it's spot trading, it's what I see, you know, a lot of tokens like actually lean into that sort of gambling economics, that kind of Ponzi-nomics, all kinds of things. Like a lot of that is actually driving a huge amount. So I think there's this huge sort of frothy, slightly bubbly, but also genuine demand from the world to have this you know, sort of gambling products, you know, whether it's good or bad for society is a different thing. But like because crypto can be decentralized and can play the regulatory arbitrage game either by having a centralized exchange that's based offshore or DeFi apps like Uniswap, I think this kind of, you know, this is this need or this demand in the, in the consumer space is being filled as a sort of regulatory arbitrage. And I think that's a huge amount of what's currently happening in, you know, what's the visible public facing surface of crypto. But at the, the base layer, the second thing that's happening, which is far more interesting is the underlying layers of finance are getting built and rewritten to enable um, global unstoppable money uh, and financial products to remove barriers and borders, to enable value to be sort of maintained and to exist outside of kind of fiat currencies that exist partly because of the strength of a nation's economy and or army or, you know, or you know, military. Um, and that's a fundamental shift, much more like the internet, but also like the internet, you know, the internet kind of sat around, you know, with researchers and universities and military applications for you know, decades before it even came out in public. And I actually think that that part of crypto is still mostly in the kind of researcher nerd phase. Like even though there's a lot of bubbly stuff on top of that's around speculation, or maybe you know people who've kind of realized what's going on and have started trying to get into like Bitcoin or some of the you know blue chip coins because they think this will eventually play out. But I actually think that these the infrastructure building takes a lot more time, and so I do think that second thing is the interesting thing. It's the thing that Vegas about, and it's is the thing which actually threatens at times to get caught up in the first thing where people are trying to regulate to make people not do things that are bad for themselves, like, you know, not gamble and not have access to these crazy things and to try and reduce scams and all that, which is, you know, laudable goals. But there's a risk that that sort of second thing gets caught up in the first thing and, and the, the attempts to, you know, nanny people into not doing things that are bad for themselves and not gambling and whatever can have an impact on the ability to build this better sort of future financial system. So I think both of those things are going on. Um, I think a lot more of the first thing has happened in the last few years since 2017, really. Yeah, Pre-2017, it was probably the second thing actually everyone was interested in. But once it sort of burst onto the stage, I think that, that sort of that first more speculative, more kind of regulatory arbitrage around speculative products and stuff, the sort of aspect of it started to take a bigger part of the slice of the pie. And I think, you know, Hopefully, we'll see the second thing come back over the next year or two. Yeah, I absolutely love that breakdown. I think you're so right. Um, and it's really why we were so interested in having yourself on to talk about Vega, uh, because what we are uh, really focused on is the second thing. Uh, the, 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 the first thing is kind of a little bit fun. And I would actually argue that the majority of people, perhaps in the crypto space, potentially not building, are here the first thing um it, it, it's been the same throughout time you know if you look at kind of uh, boom and bust with markets the tulip mania the the, the dot-com boom all that stuff but the interesting thing with crypto is it, it keeps going it's had boom and busts and continues to um go through them but there is a fundamental changing technology here um and it new infrastructure that's being spawned out of it i i think more broadly than just finance i think if we look at identities and we look at this digital world that we're moving towards, I, I really truly do believe that distributed ledgers are going to play a massive um, role in that. And it's a, I think it's an exciting world that we're moving towards. And when you look at things like AI, you know, there's a good argument for for using a distributed ledger to perhaps monitor. I think so. I mean, AI. I think it's important not to not to overplay the the crypto cryptocurrency distributed ledger side of these things. And that's to say, like, you know, you had protocols like BitTorrent, you have newer things like Valid, uh, which is super cool stuff, um, with sort of like this sort of Tor-like application layer that don't use dis dis distributed ledgers at all. And actually, I think it's important to kind of note that actually there's a huge movement towards the using computers and the internet and kind of always on connectivity and cryptography to decentralize things, to decentralize power, even messengers apps like Signal, which kind of 
sort of have zero knowledge about their users almost. Um, yeah, you know, there's this movement to sort of decentralize and use cryptography to give power back to people uh, and sort of give people a sort of ownership of their own digital lives. Uh, and not all of that requires the digital ledgers. I think the is very important and interesting to, to boost those other things as well and not to try and apply a digital ledger to everything so that everything can have a token and just go up. Uh, but the combining those sort of other distributed technologies with digital ledgers, even IPFS, right? That doesn't need a digital ledger, but you can have things like Filecoin that enable, um, you know, cryptocurrencies to be used to buy space on IPFS or whatever. Um, but so I think, you know, combining those things together is is, is the where it becomes very powerful. And the digital ledgers and the cryptocurrencies and the tokens and the coins have a very important part to play in this um, sort of narrative of things becoming decentralized. But I think it is important to sort of note that it's not just, it's not just distributed ledger technology, it's actually distributed technology powered by cryptography um, that can do all kinds of things, whether it's identity, whether it's data storage, whether it's applications that run uh, in a decentralized way. And and that includes blockchains. But yeah, I think it's a, a wider thing than just the distributed ledgers. Yeah. Do you know, you're uh, one of the few people that sort of brought perhaps myself and, and, and many of us uh, back to earth on that. And I think it's so true um, because not everything needs a token. I do think tokens do play a role in regards to, you know, how are you going to get people to um, uh, take part in these systems uh, in, in in some cases, but I, I think you're absolutely right that there, there is a lot more going on than just distributed ledgers. Of course, they're a massive part, um, uh, but I think that's so right. And uh, if, if we look at, I mean, you mentioned Filecoin there. I think there's a massive um, shift taking place with the likes of decentralized storage and also. Um, decentralized computing you know when we look at cloud computing and stuff like that if you look at what bitcoin tried to do with money you've kind of got and as a computer scientist uh, just quickly before we move on to vega protocol um what do you think about that that sort of stuff this whole idea of decentralized cloud computing is that something that excites you yeah i think it's good i think it's very cool i mean there's a lot of challenges with stuff like that like you know to get the same performance without like you know like in the naive way to do cloud computing decentralized say hey look everyone give up your computer and i'm going to download some code and some data from you pay you pay the person whose computer it is and they're going to run it and that's all good but then like what if that person starts reading all your data i mean you, know, you don't really want your accounting system to run on a decentralized cloud where it's like that so there's actually quite a lot of challenges in getting efficient cloud decentralized cloud computing for the general purpose case where you're not actually worried about you know exposing your data and there's cool cryptography for doing some of that but it does limit what can be done um I still think it's. I still think there's a lot that, that can be done there, especially when it's actually running decentralized systems. So if you're running a system like Ethereum, you're doing like decentralized cloud computing, or you know ICP or any of these other ones. Um, it's okay. Everyone can seal the contracts. They're all on chain, so it sort of makes sense. But there are limitations. Um, I think the one that is very interesting is decentralized AI training because yeah, you know AI trained models just get trained with all of the like freely available data in the world, and what you want out of the end is a set of weights that you can then download and use to do. AI inference and you know right now you've kind of got like the fully closed models you've got like the open weights and then there's a few people there's people like the Shoggoth and these other ones which are actually trying to work out how to do decentralized training so that in the end um you know in the end you can end up with models that are actually trained by everyone for everyone and I saw some stat the other day it was something like 10 million iPhones could train a pretty advanced AI model like every three days or something so you know the point is basically wow. like if you know if like 10 percent of the people in the world who have a computer or an iPhone you know, we're running training, you know, that's, that's nearly a billion people. If that many people were running decentralized AI training stuff, you could probably pr train the most powerful AI model in the world, bar none, you know, fairly quickly, and you could probably keep iterating it. And so you could really take entirely away from the closed source and, and semi-closed models, and it just requires the right technology. So I, I mean, I'm super excited about that, because I think, you know, there are lots of risks with AI, but the biggest one in the most immediate one is that a bunch of people who already have a lot of power and money gain incredibly powerful AI and can use it to get more power and money and everyone else only gets to use AI when they say so. So like to me, like that's the biggest, most extant risk for, for AI right now. And so I think, you know, open sourcing the training is like, you know, the most obvious decentralized like computing model for me is like, let's open, let's open that up. Let's distribute that. Yeah, no, fascinating. You know, I had to ask you that given your background because that's an area I'm very interested in also. Um, because I see the potential for it. And those stats that you've just brought up are, I mean, your brain just explodes with ideas and possibilities and all this um, other stuff. And I think that's going to perfectly bring us on to the uh, project you're a co-founder of, which is Vega Protocol. So 
if we could um, bring this back and we can maybe take a look at Vega protocol, you know, what was the vision? You mentioned this kind of um, controlled traditional financial system, and you've seen how you can implement cryptography to change it. What was the vision behind Vega protocol? What was the initial reason for you starting Vega? Yeah, I mean, so during sort of 2017, I guess once the sort of first explosion of apps on things like Ethereum started to to come about, um, you know, I I had recently met uh, Ramsey. Um, we I'd been working on a different startup, and he'd been helping me with some of that. And we ended up you know, becoming friends and talking a lot about what was going on in crypto. And you know, one of the things I'm very very clear about, having been in finance, is that finance is not money finance is like a whole world of stuff and services and products and things around money you know it's the ability to get loans it's the ability to build you know products that finance things products that manage risk and you know when you look at what happens in the city it's all insurance risk management investment all these different things together and the fact that some people want to invest money and get yield effectively and others want to like have you know acquire money and spend it to do things and others want to like manage risks you know when you all of those things together in an ecosystem it's like that's how the world works you know like when you, even when you look at an airline wants to buy new airplanes you know they probably don't just buy them outright they fi find a way to finance them they also do things like hedge the cost of the fuel and hedge what might happen if they have fewer customers and all of those things are little bits of financial engineering that go on and you know there's the base layer of the money you know the dollars the pounds whatever then there's the next layer of kind of like the the real assets the the stocks and shares the um you know the gold the whatever it is that you're buying the oil and then on top of that there's all of these products that are used to do that engineering and make those deals happen and make you know an airline able to purchase 100 aircraft or whatever it is or is someone able to build a large skyscraper in london and and then eventually rent out the space like all of those things require that sort of those products which are actually much more ephemeral they're not like real solid assets like the actual skyscraper or the actual shares they're like derivatives and insurance and all these other things that are basically driven by legal contracts right so you know all of these things are driven by people signing contracts and agreeing to send money in different directions and move assets around and the kind of cool thing about blockchains is that they are about writing code that can send money in different directions and move assets around and you know fundamentally that's a really interesting thing because you couldn't do that on the internet without you know basically building a company and doing it via legal contracts you could move the messages the data over the internet but the assets couldn't move over the internet um so smart contracts are really interesting because they're not really contracts at all they're code but they do the same thing as financial contracts which is they create rules that move money and assets around and so you know during 2017 what we were sort of realizing was like if you look at all that financial world people were building just about building things like ether delta like decentralized exchanges and they were building tokens and money and tokenized real world assets and stable coins and all of that and even though all those things had their genesis probably back in like 2016 2017 but really people weren't thinking about all these products that needed to sit on top of it you know maybe very early like insurance products were being thought, thought about but in a very simplified way and what we sort of you know we're talking about and i sort of said to ramsey was like if we're going to decentralize the financial system we're going to have this different system that works on all these new assets we need to be able to have all of those things that happen today in the in the sort of real world in london in new york hong kong wherever and we need to have those things and they can't be like a toy version you know like they can start off like a toy version you know they're just a little bit of fun but eventually they need to be able to do you know scale up to be able to finance a building or hedge the price of oil for your for fueling your airplane and they need to do that cap in a capital efficient way and in a way that makes sense and so we started thinking about like how you would build infrastructure that fits into that crypto ecosystem that enables those products and really you know that's what vega is vega is like you know we sat down with some some researchers who'd been working at ucl and they ended up founding Chainspace and you know a bunch of other crypto companies but we sat down with them and, and started saying well let's um we would like to do this how do we do it and you know they basically started talking about proof of stake about the different technology they'd looked at and helping us kind of muddle through architecting the first version of a solution to this um and you know what i sort of came up with was this i you know the, the basic idea from my past of like how to do this technically on the product level and then i we sort of merged that with this information from these guys on like how to build a robust and performant distributed system um, and that's really what Vega intends to be. It intends to be that infrastructure for running all of those financial products, running all those derivatives, uh, and doing it in a way that's like capital efficient enough that people could really move real world use cases onto it. 
Yeah, uh, a, a, a lot covered there. Um, like I say, my brain's just going crazy with with with, with all questions I could ask you on that. Um, one place definitely to start though was how are you guys? So in, instead of how are you trying to achieve that? What sort of technology are you using to do that? Are you on Ethereum, for example? Are you your own chain? Could you maybe talk to me a little bit about that? Yeah, so we've 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 built an app chain, uh, as as they call it nowadays. Um, don't know if it had that name. I don't think that name had been invented back when we started doing it. But you know, we basically said, well, when you look at all the things that need to be done to make this work, you know, like you look at how fees should work, you look at like the performance that's needed, you look at like the throughput that's needed, you look at like all the matching engine, all these other bits. It was sort of clear to us that the best thing to do was to have a chain where the chain was restricted in what it could do to this kind of big, I mean, it's a pretty broad use case, you know, create any kind of financial product and trade it. Uh, but it was restricted to just that use case as broad as it might be and didn't include all the other uses of things like Ethereum, which allow you to like optimize all these different parts. So we ended up building building a chain, uh, the Vega chain, that is currently bridged to Ethereum and will in future be bridged to others. So effectively, we kind of take, borrow or bridge the assets from other chains for trading. Um, the trading activity happens on Vega and, and the assets are issued elsewhere. Uh, so that's kind of the sort of underlying architecture of Vega. Brilliant. And, and did you use, I take it you used an SDK for that? Um, was that maybe a Cosmos SDK or a... a, it was what? a the predecessor. So we we use Tendermint or now Comet BFT, Brilliant. which is like the consensus layer. We don't actually really use the Cosmos SDK, although probably sometime next year we will start incorporating some of the Cosmos SDK bits in so we can do things like IBC and yeah. um you know maybe even Cosm Wasm for for more programmability and stuff like that. So we will start probably including some bits of Cosmos SDK, but really we kind of Tendermint consensus layer and then just this custom um you know derivatives chain on top. Yeah, and um wh wh where is Vega right now? You know, uh, uh, what, 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 it, it's a massively, uh, if I'm allowed to say this, ambitious project that you're uh, undertaking. Um, and, you know, it's so needed. Uh, and I'd love to, once we've, we've covered this, go into what are the real benefits of DeFi over CeFi. But um, where is Vega currently? You know, what stage are you currently at? You've got so much that needs to be um, done, I guess. And, and, and you've been working on it since what, 2017, 2018. Where are you currently at? What, what can people do on Vega? So with this year, we released the first version of the software that actually kind of enabled proper trading. The chain had been live for just over a year at that point um, in May. Um, but really, the sort of the, the sort of primary use case sort of began in earnest in May. Um, we're still sort of in what I would call an alpha. We have a bunch of kind of like little like guardrails to try and, you know, prevent people who don't understand what they're doing from like, say, depositing very large amounts of money. Uh, so it's very much designed to still be in a kind of early phase. Um, the alpha is also restricted on the kind of products you can create. So at the moment, you can create futures and perpetuals. Um, so at the moment, what we're doing is effectively that stuff is live in mainnet, is being run entirely by validators, sort of fully decentralized. There are none of these like off switches or admin codes that we have. It's fully run by the validators, fully decentralized. Um, but it's, it's running with those products. Um, I think there's like eight or nine markets, like you know, sort of four. Uh, futures and four or five perpetuals that are currently live, uh, all created by our community and being traded. The liquidity providers, again, sourced from the community, being paid on chain by the protocol for doing that. Uh, so people have started trading on the protocol. People are giving a lot of feedback. Uh, we're in that early stage, that early alpha. I think, you know, probably for the next three or four months, we'll probably still be in that kind of pretty early stage, like working very closely with the users, like getting feedback, iterating the UX, iterating the protocol, making it as secure as we can. Um, we've got a few cool things we're going to be rolling out too soon as well. But like right now we're in that early phase. People people can actually start trading on it. People can use the system as intended and people can start creating their own markets and everything. Fantastic. And I want to explore this idea of creating your own market because when you've kind of... Um, looked at uh, the necessity for vega uh you've mentioned lots of things you know the if you want to buy a plane example there's going to need to be a market for the things that are associated with that and if you want to build a skyscraper or just just the things that are maybe more uh basic that exist in the traditional financial world what is this concept of creating a market could we could we maybe go into that and how that actually works i think this is still a new i mean I'm sure it is probably something that hasn't crossed most people's minds is creating their own market for a, for a specific thing. But it's something that um, this movement is really allowing people to do. And of course, Vega's 
making headway with it. So what's this whole idea of creating a market? Yeah. So, I mean, if you think of the sort of TradFi world and, and like crypto prior to DEXs, um, you know, you in the say, London Stock Exchange, it's not super expensive to get listed, but you have to meet lots of criteria and it takes a very long time and the actual process and the lawyers and everything else will be expensive. So getting listed on the LSE, pretty hard. Um, when you had a token and you want to get listed on Binance, also pretty hard, right? You know, like you know, a lot of this, a lot of the exchanges even charge a huge amount of money, sort of extort people into trying to you know, be expensive to get listed. Yeah, it's, it's a bit of a nightmare. And then you had Uniswap came along and said, hey, look, if you've got a token, you can just create a market on Uniswap and it's easy and you can put some money in the pairs and off you, off you go. Um, and that was a huge breath of fresh air. Um, you know, others like Bancor kind of led the way first, but Uniswap was the first big success there. And so now the idea that if someone makes a token, like, it can be tradable and have a market and a price because anyone can create that market on Uniswap. It's kind of like baked in. Everyone understands that. Um, what hasn't yet happened is that same thing for derivatives. So at the moment, you know, all of the derivatives, even most of the DEXs or all of the DEXs that I've seen um, pretty much still have this model where some team somewhere is saying, hey, look, we're going to make this tradable now. We're going to list this, this pair. We're going to launch this market. And we're basically doing what Uniswap did for Spot. We're saying... If you know an oracle that can price it, if you understand like the parameters and how you want that market set up and how you want that product to be, you can come along on the Vega chain. You, know, you need a few tokens to do it. Uh, and then you can propose that market gets created. Um, and then effectively, you know, a day or two later, as long as the community don't flag it effectively as being, you know, some kind of, um, you know, fraudulent type of situation, then that market is going to end up getting created and everyone can start trading it. So, you know, that basically just opens up this idea that someone says, hey, look, this token is like, super this project is like super hot everyone likes it but the token is locked and the only people who hold it can't sell it so i can't get the token hey well i could create a market on that futures market on that on vega and then we could start trading it and i don't need anyone's permission i can just go do that you know so that's really what happens there and you know to start with it's going to be those simple things like the you know, locked token or just an existing token that people want to trade in derivatives form or you know, some other derivative, like weather derivatives or the price of oil or whatever people want to trade. But over time, I think what people will do, and especially next year, once we introduce two things, one is the sort of passive, you know, AMM style liquidity and like a much easier front end for creating markets. And also once we start making the products more programmable and customizable uh, via the sort of Vega SDK, then you'll see people start to really not just like think about tokens and things they'd like to have you know, say futures access to trade, you'll see them design new products like basket products, different products, like some new take on an option, you know, and that's going to be super cool because that enables like, yeah, actually the kind of financial engineering and innovation that up until now only happens in, you know, the kind of quant desks and trading floors of a few companies globally. Yeah, I've always had this vision of, uh, and I've explored it through many different ways, like creating an NFT or, or something like that, that would represent kind of a futures in the form of an NFT, a basket of cryptocurrencies. But that's something that could be possible on, on Vega in the future is you could essentially create a futures that tracks a basket of cryptocurrencies and create a market for that. Yeah, you could actually do that now. I mean, so Vega has this um, this framework for Oracle pricing called um, the sort of Ethereum Oracle framework, where it can read data from Ethereum contracts. So even though Vega's own chain can read data from Ethereum contracts and use that as the Oracle price. So, if you created an Ethereum contract that say get, grabbed the price for the ten cryptos you're interested in from Uniswap and weighted them all by like I don't know trading volume or some number you wanted and calculated a single price and made that into a sort of Ethereum call. You could create that contract and just deploy that to Ethereum any time. You could then go and propose a market on Vega and say, this market looks at the price on that contract to settle. So you could basically create a, a contract that settles on the price of your basket, tie that up to an, a Vega market, and then go and supply some liquidity. And then you know that market could exist and people could trade this basket. And you know I don't know how long it would take to write the Ethereum contract, but my guess is a few days and a bit more testing time. And then the market creation on Vega would be you know probably less than a day of work um and then you would have that so yeah that could that's something you could do on vega now wow uh like i say when you think about the future that we're moving towards and the digitalization of everything you know um the the possibilities of what vega is going to be doing in the future are quite literally endless uh not just the digitalization from a, a maybe a spot point of view but also from a future and a prep point of view um it, it's very very exciting and this is really why i wanted to have you on when people think about dexes they think about things like Uniswap, you know, they think about things like that. And actually DEXs, I think, are far more than just a place to go and trade one-to-one -one crypto. 
you know they are yeah. the futures of markets almost you know and we well, yeah and i think there's a there's a sort of a, in crypto and DeFi, you know in in ethereum particularly what you end up with is like i think partly probably because of the security sort of and the the performance of ethereum you sort of end up every time there's a new product someone also builds a new dex they also build like all the infrastructure around it and they have to like remake the amm the order but whatever it is they're doing like you end up building the entire trading platform every time there's a new product so every product is own project with its own trading platform with its own slightly different api um unless it's like literally a fork of uniswap like sushi swap is um whereas you know, the, I think what you need is a better abstraction layer. And it's kind of like, if I remember in the early dot-com boom, making a, a online business required renting space in a data center and buying a server and going there and plugging it in. You know, maybe if you were lucky, you could pay someone to do the plugging it in, but you still had owned a physical server. And then now you have like Heroku and Amazon Web Services and all these others. You're like, I'm going to write some code. I'm probably going to download a tool. I probably get free space for a while. I can like upload this thing and I have a website that can like take payments and do all this stuff. And so suddenly like all of the like infrastructure got abstracted away and I just focus on like designing my website, maybe even on something like Squarespace. And like suddenly I have a business. Um, and I think you need to get that. That leap still needs to happen in DeFi from like, everyone who programs a wants to program a product because let's face it like you know the settlement of your basket product is incredibly simple it's like take 10 prices apply weighting work out the price of the basket send that to the settlement engine however often you want to do that you know once a day once every eight hours as a perp or something that is an incredibly simple thing and so the idea that you need to build the entire trading system and do, and go through all of the audits of like an AMM curve and like settlement and making sure people can't extract the money, kind of crazy. Really, all you should have to do is program that price and the system should be able to deal with that. And so I think that's the leap that DeFi and DEXs need to take is actually we instead of instead of everyone thinking, oh, I'm building a DEX, I'm building a trading platform, I'm running an exchange, they should be thinking I'm building a platform for people to build products and people to build markets and actually the developers the users the quants the traders are going to go build those markets not the who build on the platform and that's really the promise of stuff like vega is like opening that up for everyone to go and do that yeah in the true kind of uh fashion of the uh, 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 of the broader movement uh, and in the talking about decentralization who gets to decide what does and doesn't get listed on the platform is there some sort of a a, a process a governance process because governance i think is also this area that's so it, people almost ignore governance, but actually it's, I think a vital part of the overall um, happening of what, yeah, what, so what's currently going on. that's token holders. Um, so currently the way that works is that every, every market that someone wants to deploy is effectively a proposal to deploy a market rather than a guaranteed deployment. Um, and token holders will probably vote against it if they think it is a bad idea. Like mostly if they think it's like super badly specified and it's going to fail, or if they think it's like fraudulent, you know, like you say, this is going to settle to my basket of currencies, but actually you control an admin key and you're just going to like set the price to whatever you want and to steal everyone's money, you know, because you can easily do that. Um, so you know, pe people need to look into those things, look into what is this Oracle? Do we actually have a good reason to trust that Oracle? Can we see the code on Ethereum or whatever? Um, so, you know, that's the kind of sort of missing step and that's what governance has to do. At the moment, there's a kind of, I think it's 10 or 20,000 tokens is currently the number that you need to make one of those proposals. Um, our suggestion, although we don't control this as a team, it's kind of up to the community, but our suggestion is over time that should reduce down to a much smaller number so that basically it's just a little hump to get over to stop people spamming the network, but actually it's a little bit easier to, to launch a market. Um, and then the other thing that might happen in future is like, you know, Uniswap lets anyone create a pool, but it only shows certain assets and pools in its main front end based on like lists that it considers like good tokens or whatever. And um, we could end up moving to that kind of model where actually yeah, the front anyone can more easily create crazy markets, but they kind of just don't appear in any front end by default. And then you kind of have like an on chain vote to sort of list it in the front end rather than uh, to gate the creation. There's a few things to work out before that could be done, but I think you could end up in that model. So yeah, governance overall, governance's job is to try and either prevent people creating bad or fraudulent markets, or at least prevent people accidentally going and trading in things that are kind of dodgy or not going to work well. Yeah, fascinating. Um, and 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 do you and, and as somebody that's you know really trying to evolve um, an entire sector, more than one sector, what do you think the future looks like? Do you think? I mean, I I, I think most things are going to be tokenized in some form of or, or 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 another. I think it makes sense to do that from a, a provenance point of view, from a global point of view, in terms of 
uh, using it, you know, it, from a price point of view, from from everything, uh, for, for many, many reasons. As somebody that's got the wealth of knowledge like you have on this space and the traditional financial world, do you align with that view? Do you think that most things are going to be tokenized in the future? I think I think they will in some form, but I'm not sure that form will always be like what sort of OG crypto people like ourselves or like you know, Ethereum users I consider that, if that makes sense. So like, you know, in some cases, maybe they'll be tokenized on a permission network, which actually only a bunch of people who are regulated get to use. Or in other cases, they'll end up, you know, spread across different chains or they'll end up kind of tokenized, but where there's like a kind of overarching like administrative control. And actually, you know, this can be important. Like if you look at like property ownership, for instance, it's an insane idea if anyone thinks that who owns a house should entirely be on chain. So if I like steal your house house NFT, I suddenly own your house and it's irrevocable. You know, like if I steal your bo your your um board ape, I kind of own your ape now and I nothing you can do about it. Like if that happened with houses, I don't think anyone would be very happy. So like clearly the house NFT is going to need a way for some group of people who have power to come in and go, oh, actually, we're going to take it off you because you stole it and we're going to give it back to the person who owns it. And they're going to need a way to deal with all of that. They're going to need a way to discover that happened, which means actually the final say on the ownership doesn't exist on chain. It still exists with the courts of the land. Um, and I think, you know, um, what's the, there's a, I can't remember, Materium is the, um, Vinay Gupta's startup is, is deep in doing that. They're deep in actually building the incredibly complex legal contracts needed to have things like a token represent that kind of ownership, but in a way that makes sense and works with the laws of the land. And I think that's probably going to be a thing that happens too. So yeah, I think you'll have, I think digital assets and digital ownership and digital representations, mostly on things that are kind of blockchain like will make a lot of sense for a lot of areas of finance and ownership. I don't think it will look like everyone owning ERC whatever's um, in MetaMask to move to buy and sell houses and cars. I think that might be possible if you want to, but I don't think that'll be the most common. And actually that's you know, where I sort of think the interesting thing is like Ethereum's got by far the most adoption in crypto, but compared to the size of the market in the world, it's got almost no adoption at all, which is to say like if the if the solution turns up and it uses SUI or Solana or whatever else, and actually that gets mass market adoption, suddenly whatever chain that's on will be 100x bigger than Ethereum in terms of usage. So, you know, I really feel like how that actually goes, the kind of tokenization and digitalization of everything, I think it's inevitable to some extent, but how it looks and whether or not it's the way we all want it to be is going to be a different question. You know, I'm chuckling to myself here because I, I've spent so long and I've spoke to people who are tokenizing commercial real estate, uh, tokenizing the commodities market, all of this stuff. And I've never actually thought about what you just said there. And that is what happens if somebody comes along and hacks your MetaMask? And you lose your house. I mean, <laughs> this is just an absurd uh, uh, problem. It's not an absurd problem. It's a it's a real problem that there's going to be entire markets that are probably going to spawn to have to solve that and a, a new way of looking at it. If, if things are going to be tokenized, then you are totally right to address that. Well, what happens if somebody comes and steals your house? I mean, and look, this yeah, the world's sort of been here before. Like you know, shares used to be who owns the share certificate and you, know, you used to have many more bearer assets, you know, bearer bonds and whatever. And over time, those assets have started to become registered. They're in databases. They're not decentralized databases, but actually when I buy stocks, I don't get sent a bit of you know, certificate anymore. I just, someone updates a record in a centralized database. And actually, you know, everyone decided that actually just saying who owns this and that's, you know, possession is all of the law in finance. That's not been the case for, for a long time, except for with like cash. Uh, and there is an argument, a very good argument, I think, for digital cash of like, if I own these Bitcoins or these USDT, they're mine and you can't steal them from me, although USDT can be, I think, frozen. Um, but, you know, like if I own these Bitcoins, they're mine and you can't take them from me. There's a good argument for that and for that being the right way to do money. But I think as soon as you get into the bigger assets like houses and cars and stuff, people are going to actually say we would rather it was like registered somewhere and actually... I had someone come up and say someone steals it. And actually, probably a lot of people in the world who end up using crypto wallets, even for money, would probably rather have something semi-custodial, you know, where actually there is a way to recover their assets. Like, hopefully it's like not fully custodial. It's more like a kind of recovery system for a, a non-custodial wallet. But like, I think most people actually don't want to have to know that they have to get their OPSEC totally right and they have to follow all the right security practices and update their laptop. Otherwise, they're going to lose their life savings. So that's not a thing most people want. Uh, we're weird in crypto for wanting that, I think.
I absolutely totally agree. Um, I think some of us do genuinely want that. But I think actually when you look as a whole, there's also a lot of people I wouldn't want for them to have that responsibility, you know, because I, I just don't think they're... I mean, uh, you know, most of my most of my family, most of my friends, yeah. like, would, would I want, like, my sister life savings to be down to whether she or all the other things she has to do decides to also become a computer nerd and learn about security like it doesn't make any sense you know and i i want to be able to manage my trezors and multi-sigs and shamir secret saving i want a good portion of my assets to be stored like that because i kind of like it and feel comfortable with it but i don't think most people do or should no it's one of the real pain points i have is when i'm trying to get people to set up ledgers and stuff like this it's so scary i mean i remember when i first set up a metamask you know, I was like, whoa, and I'd been familiar with setting up uh, wallets before, but even the new experience and now it feels native. But when I onboard, I mean, my grandparents, I, they both got MetaMasks, believe it or not. And they were looking around the room like there was a poltergeist when we were going through the whole uh, process. But it, it's, I think you've brought up some absolutely phenomenal points there in regards to, um, there is in some cases still the need for, can we call them middlemen? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think the question is, I, I let's I'd like to call them service providers because I think in finance you have a middleman. It's like I'm accessing this market, I'm doing this thing, and there's someone who literally sits between me and that thing. And I don't think that's what you want. Like you can have that in crypto. You know, there are plenty of custodial service providers who are also basically middlemen, you know, Coinbase, some of the custodial wallets, whatever. Like, but actually I think what you do want is a is a model more like um a service provider that does things. You know, you have these like multi-party computation wallets you know where you actually have a custodian who doesn't have access to your assets hopefully but maybe what they do is they provide you with a wallet ux um you have access to your assets but also there's like a couple of third parties who can get together to recover them for you um and you know a little bit of security so i think there's like there's a model which is like not actually having a middleman who really sits in the middle and controls you and every financial flow goes through them and you pay them a fee i don't think we want that but i think having a service provider who provides you with a cryptographic wallet that also has some extra features around security and recovery. That sort of sounds like probably what I would imagine you want. And you know, realistically, it's probably either going to be your bank or like Apple or Google, right? In the long yeah. run, it's going to be, you know, look at password managers, right? Like nerdy people like me use like 1Password or KeyPass or whatever. Everyone else just uses like whatever the iPhone does to remember your password for you. And it locks it with the secure element and it's pretty secure. And the reality is probably someone like that is going to be the one who's able to create the cryptographic identity for you, secure things, and probably be the ones you can phone up when you lose your iPhone and say, I want to restore this. Um, and that probably will be built into that infrastructure. Yeah, I, when Ledger came out with their announcement, although um, I, I think there's some pros and cons, but generally I looked at it and I thought, actually, this is perfect for some people. It really is. But yeah, I mean, they're trying to solve a problem that needs to be solved. I think, I mean, they went about it in a sort of candid way. And I think giving people this, you know, Ledger was always scary to me because it's kind of closed source compared to like Trezor and, um, you know, is it Keystone of the new one? It's also open source. Like Ledger was always a bit scary to me because it's closed source and it's kind of like you've got this closed source thing, you're updating the firmware, you maybe have access to my keys. Now you're telling me you can recover my keys. Like even if I turn that off, does that mean you could recover them if you wanted? Or like, yeah. And so I I think Ledger did that badly. And, and yes, you know, I think there was a better way to do that. Um, but the problem they were trying to solve is a real one. It's like, how do you onboard the next however many people? Um, I'm not sure that things like Ledger actually, you know, the problem for Ledger is I think their 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 strength is their hardware, and their the reality is most people won't have separate hardware. Like the iPhone's you know, secure element is just as secure, really, as pretty much as secure as like a Ledger hardware. You know, give or take the fact it's in the same devices, maybe some software issues, but like probably close enough to being as secure. Um, that you don't need to worry too much. And so for most people, it's going to be software in the operating system of your phone or whatever that actually secures this stuff, not some extra hardware. And I think yeah, people are much more likely to move forward with that kind of wallet. And you know, I guess Ledger are trying to work out how to keep themselves relevant in that world and and trying to solve that problem. But I'm not sure that what they did was really quite the right way to do it. Yeah, I love that take. No, I totally agree. Um, and, and, and to sort of bring things back with to, to, to what you guys are doing uh, over at Vega, let's talk about the because some people really still might not um, get some of the benefits of de like decentralization and using something like Vega. Could we maybe talk about the benefits of DeFi in Vega's 
situation over CFI? You know, what are the kind of benefits generally? What are the benefits for the users? What are the benefits for for for, for the parties involved? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think um, yeah, the, some of the benefits are simply uh, around like the transparency, the open source nature. So you know, when you look at um, you know, crypto and crypto exchanges and, and moving money around in crypto, you kind of have this situation where the centralized exchanges are all or often are in, you know, like let's say sort of weird jurisdictions with, with less oversight. And actually they're like a black box. You can't see what's happening. And then every so often something like FTX happens. Um, so that kind of shows the one of the issues with centralized. And actually if something's centralized and you can't see inside it, you kind of want it to be pretty well regulated because otherwise it might be doing dodgy stuff. Um, the alternative is obviously to have it be decentralized, have it be open, have it be transparent, have it be open source, and be able to audit the state of that network or that that system. And I think you know, so that's number one. You know, you can't have you can have other things. You can have hacks and blow ups and other issues, but you can't have like the FTX situation on a you know, decentralized protocol. So that's you know that's the first one. And then the second one obviously is the whole reason we're here you know we went back at the beginning of this this um interview we talked about like thing one and thing two with the kind of regulatory arbitrage and gambling and whatever and then with the kind of like changing finance and actually like this idea of like making assets and finance open and programmable for everyone making them global making it so that anyone can innovate on them anyone can build on them anyone can compose different bricks and bits together and come up with new things um opening that up and making that sort of internet of money and taking their finance back and giving it back giving access to it back and ownership back to sort of people and democratizing it that's kind of fundamentally what crypto is is sort of all about trying to do and you know one of the benefits of DeFi is that you're participating in that you know if you use a DeFi product then maybe you can take your position that you've got on that DeFi product and plug it into a lending protocol and do another thing. You know, maybe you can get another, a different way to find yield. Maybe you can compose different things together. Maybe someone else who offered you that product is able to take their side of that and do something. So by participating in this kind of network of DeFi products that's constantly evolving and improving, you are participating in that open network. And if you're a user, that means that eventually you'll have access to a much wider variety of products and potentially better efficiency uh, because of all of these different innovations that are going on. And if you're a developer or someone who's providing liquidity or capital, then that means that you have the ability to build those innovations and to connect things together. You know, if I've got a position on Binance, that's it. Like I've got a position on Binance. I can look at it and I can close it and I can take the money out and I can add more money and Binance can take my money and do things with it. But there's no ecosystem around that position. There's nothing else that can happen. It's like, it's just there. And I think the big advantage of DeFi is that everything that happens there is part of this decentralized network of, of innovations. It's much more like the internet of money and it's very open to those innovations. So, I mean, that's, to me, that's the big one that, that will change things slowly but surely over time as more and more people discover the different ways they can innovate on top of those different layers that are being built. Yeah. And again, I, I've said this multiple times throughout the interview, but it's why I was so excited to have you on. You know, I do really feel like Vega is a, 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 at the helm of that, uh, along with yourself um, and the, 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 the traditional sort of financial experience that you have, I, I think puts you at a great advantage. And I think Vega is a, a great project. You know, I've, I, I've had a look at it. Uh, knowing I was going to do this interview and a lot of things make sense. And I, I, we've gone and we've covered a really wide range of subjects. Um, but I think, the overall picture is, is very clear in regards to what Vega are doing. You know, it truly is fundamentally changing a lot. Um, and if people want to find out more about Vega, we're going to leave links in the description to the website, your Twitter. Uh, if people want to find out about yourself or perhaps more about the Vega protocol, what would you suggest the best way for them to do that is? Yeah, so I would say um, you know, our Discord's uh, pretty active and is a good place to come and ask questions and and get deep in and uh, and chat to us. You can find the link there on vega.xyz. Um, Vega Protocol is the Twitter, and that's also where we post a lot of news and updates as well. My personal Twitter is at Barnaby, B-A-R-N-A-B-E-E. -E. Um, and yeah, I would encourage people really to try it out. Like, you know, you can use MetaMask. Actually, MetaMask have a feature called Snaps, which enable you to actually connect MetaMask directly to Vega to sign on Vega's chain. You can also download the Vega wallet for like Firefox or 
Chrome um, and as a desktop and command line version as well. Um, it's kind of just fun to try it out and see what it can do. And, you know, for everyone who listened to my thing one and thing two and was like, you know, I know thing two is really like the future of finance, but I just like thing one. I just like to like play around on the price of coins and make a little punt. Um, don't worry, because the first use case of anything like Vega and, you know, it's kind of the the toy use case that comes before all the the big changes. The first use case of things like Vega is all of the the crypto markets and, you know, the sort of perpetuals that, that people are used to. So if, you know, if those are things that, that interest you, then I really just encourage you to try out trading them on a decentralized exchange and see how good the UX can be, see how good the experience can be and sort of, you know, and then go and check out like, you know, do a trade and then go to the Vega block explorer and like check out like I can see my transaction and my trade and I can see how it interacted and I can see everyone else's stuff like check out the fact that it's actually decentralized and see what feel get a feeling for what that means and and just give it a try and uh, join us in discord with any questions yeah the best right way to learn to ride a bike is to get on the bike and I always encourage people to play around you know it, it, it can be with a very small amount of money but the experience that you're going to gain from that I think is going to um, assist you in the future. Exactly, yeah, we have a test net called Fairground. You can play with fake money. Um, I personally am someone who just thinks I just shove. You know, anytime I see one of these new things, it's interesting. I just shove like fifty USDT or whatever in and play with real money because it sort of makes it more real for me. But you know, you can play on the test net. You can play with a small amount on the main net. Whatever you want to do. Um, we very much encourage feedback and and input because we know, you know, as I said, we still launched in May and we know there's lots to iterate and improve to make it perfect from a UX perspective and a product perspective, but um, yeah, uh, give it a go. Yeah, Barney, the last thing for me to do is thank you very much for coming on the show. I really do appreciate your time. Uh, it's been eye opening for me uh, and I'm, you know, honored to, uh, to, to have conducted this interview. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for having me.